class this morning. I'm Caitlin Amplis. I'm the extension educator out of Washington County. My specialty is soil and compost, but I've also been working with some producers around the state on trying some different cover crops. Um, so what I'd like to share with you this morning is mostly photos of some of the different things we've seen around the area this last few years and what people have been experimenting with. Um, choosing a cover crop mixture is, um, there, are, there are hundreds of right ways to do it, right? So it's not, I can't be very prescriptive based on what you may be needing or what your operation is. So what I'm gonna share with you is just some ideas and different things you might consider. And I would highly encourage you to come up here and look at some of these. Um, look at some of these different seeds, look at some of these different crops. I, I, as I said, there, I got a, I've got a nice prize if anybody can match most of these to the picture, to the, the seed to the picture. Some of them you'll notice as, uh, you'll notice their seed, their um, food crops. So we have um, flax in here, buckwheat, uh, millet, peas, lentil. Um, those are all food crops, right, things that we eat. So uh, oats, um, radish, turnip. So the, the term cover crop really is pretty general. It's really anything you're growing that's not a cash crop, right? And when we talk about cover crops for grazing, we, that might even be a little bit of a misnomer in that it's not technically a cover crop, it's actually more of an alternative annual forage crop, which is a bit of a mouthful. So um, it's the, the, really the thing to think about is it's not a cash crop. Typically it has soil benefits of some sort. Soil benefits often can be used to interrupt pest and disease cycles. For example, there's radishes that some of the sugar bee growers will plant. They're called trap crop radishes that will help interrupt the nematode life cycle, for example. They provide pollinator services. Um, and then, as I was saying, they're also an, an alternative annual forage crop. So I'll show some pictures of that where it may not technically be a cover crop, but we use a lot of the same species and again, it's used for grazing. Somebody very clever um, came up with this idea of a periodic table of cover crops. And maybe it would be actually helpful to turn the light off on this one. Thank you. And you can see you have grasses here. And grasses, if you think back to the chemistry class, you'll remember the periodic table. Cool season and warm season. Grass, grasses, broadleaf plants, and within the broadleaf are legumes. This is just an example of some spinach, chard, carrot, clover, fava bean, peanut, soybean, um, sun hemp, all these things, um, cucurbits, so that's squashes and cucumbers. Uh, teff is, a, is another annual grass that makes really great hay and also is used as a food, in Af as a, it's from Africa and it's a grain for food. You have a lot of your cereal grasses, your cereal uh, crops here, some of your brassicas, so really, it's a pretty, anything can be considered a cover crop if it does the job that you want it to do, which is perhaps build soil, break disease cycles, give the cows something to eat. That could be considered a cover crop. In your garden, it could be just taking all your leftover seeds at the end of the year and throwing them out and letting them grow up a few inches before they freeze. That's a cover crop, right? It can be really, it's a very general term and you're gonna think, think broad on it, right? A lot of people will say when you're selecting a mix of cover crop species, whether you're gonna go two, species or 15 species, the idea is you select a wide range of, of species so that you maybe have some grass and some legumes and some other broadleaf, some cool season and some warm season, some tall ones, some short ones, so that you, you, you have, if, if one thing doesn't thrive, something else will and they'll complement each other and they'll grow at different times, they'll, they'll thrive in warmer weather and then in cooler weather, some will provide pollinators, some will provide better grazing, so you just, the diversity becomes a benefit, right? So you just pick a variety of things that are gonna do well in that system, and then you hope some of them thrive, right? And in certain years, if you use the same mix four years in a row, certain years one thing's gonna thrive, and then the next year, based on different conditions, something else in that mix will thrive, and so you just kinda get something is gonna grow, hopefully. Um, I'm gonna show you some pictures of around the basin and some of the things I've seen in the last several years. The, this is a trial we were putting in cover crops following barley. So there's not a lot of residue in this field. It was this and then harrow following barley harvest. So it was a regular full tillage field. Cover crops were planted at the end of August. And then we had research plots within that field. Some of the, the farmer fertilized the, most of the field when they put down cover crop seed. And we did, did some research plots without fertilizer. And you can see the difference. This is 
is our research plots, no added nutrients after barley harvest, and this is the farm, um, the rest of it where they put down fertilizer. What this tells us is that they're very lean on their barley nitrogen management, which is good. They're not leaving a lot of extra nitrogen in their field after harvest, so that's a good. That's good. So, but what we found was that um, if you really want, a, if you want a lot more cover crops for grazing, you can see there's some grasses in here, probably some radish and turnips, and then some barley, some of the regrowth barley. They added another 90 units of nitrogen per acre when they do that seed on, and they got much better growth there than on the parts where it wasn't fertilized. So you then have to look at the cost of the fertilizer and the added additional grazing that you would get. So in this situation, if you the, the thing to do here would have been um, if you wanted to experiment on your own place, for example, and you want to decide is it worth fertilizing or not fertilizing, or what do I need? You split your field or you run strips in your field or you use some section that has added nitrogen and some section that doesn't, and then you measure your forage production on each section, and then you figure out across your field is it worth at the cost of those extra units of nitrogen. And then you can, and it may or may not be, depending on what, how much grazing you get out of it, when you need it, and the quality, right? So that's just something we found following barley harvest in the Bighorn Basin is that they're very lean on their nitrogen management, which is a good thing. They're not wasting money on nitrogen. But for following, for cover crops, it helps to add something. The other thing is that if you don't, that every day counts in a fall harvest, getting on a fall, fall barley harvest for a fall cover crop. And so really getting that on as soon as you can, like within days of harvest, because, um, and getting that water turned on, getting those plants growing, because it's gonna get cold and our days are shortening and every day counts for that fall growth, right? So this one is the next year, this is 2019. Again, 90 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is in September and November, so we got a freeze. Growth slowed down, it's just not as much there as an earlier freeze. Were they putting any phosphorus or potassium you know, on that? Well, only nitrogen on this particular field. Um, but again, you know, you depending on what your goals are. If your goals are just to keep the soil from blowing and get a little bit of cover, or if your goals are more grazing, then you, you want to add more nutrients to get that. Or maybe you have some residual in that field. You know that you have enough organic matter or some residual in that field that you could use. So there's a lot of factors. Um, we, we've had really good luck with the turnips and the brassicas using small amounts of, of phosphorus mm -hmm. and potassium. Mm -hmm. Potassium can really help for the root development. Absolutely. On those root crops. Yeah. And then, of course, depending on your soil type. So where I've seen the potassium deficiency in the Worland area has been on really sandy soils. We don't see a lot of it on the heavier clay soils. So knowing what your soil type is, what your history is on those fields, and how much maybe manure or grazing has been in the past, um, absolutely. There, you know, it, because of that short growing cycle, you don't need much. Right. They're not, yeah, exactly. But if you don't get them in the ground until the end of August. Now, if you have a year where you get an early harvest and you can get them right back in that field at the middle of July, end of July, um, depending on what you're doing. So that's something to think about is how much time you're going to have for these to grow before it gets too cold. Some of these um, did overwinter a little bit. So we went out early, early spring the next year and looked at some of these and we had a lot of snow cover. And some of the peas and some of the grasses had overwintered. There was still a little bit of growth on them. but. One thing we've also learned about the peas in this situation is there's just not enough time to fix any nitrogen. So while some of the winter peas, they did get a little bit of growth and they did overwinter, they didn't put any nitrogen into the soil. So the winter peas, or the peas, field peas, if you want them for nitrogen fixation, need to go in a lot earlier in the year to get the good growth. And I'll show you some pictures of that too. This is a field in Hot Springs County. This is part of our ancient grains research projects also. This is einkorn wheat, which is a very old, old variety of wheat that's very much taller and has a stronger, or a thinner, taller stalk than modern wheat. This is a no-till field. This has been no-till for probably eight or nine years. Really beautiful soil, about three and a half percent organic matter. They seeded this um, aerially. So they used the helicopter to seed this on August 27th. Um, I was really amazed. So what I did, this picture is hard to see, but this was a, this was the line of straw that had come out of the combine. and. I pushed it back for this photo, but that seed, when it was aerially seeded, went, aerially seeded, went right through that straw and right into the soil. It was pretty amazing, actually, how um, how much those seeds penetrated through that, that residue. Again, it's a no-till field, and there was a lot of harvest residue left sitting on top. So you can see where it's shaded here. There are little grasses coming up. So that was a month 
would have received on August 27th, which is less than a month later, and then the following then October. So there's a little more growth there. But again, it's not it's not going to get very tall, right? Because it's so late. Is this an irrigated field? This is a uh, flood irrigated field. And then how late do you think they have water? Um, he said he didn't get enough water on this and he, this that particular year, and he thought he could have got more water on it. And I think for him it was probably a matter of just time and then other projects and whatnot. Um, he's not, yeah, so I don't know. I think they could have gotten more water on it and gotten a little more growth, potentially seeded it earlier. He said um, they had trouble getting the aerial applicator there when he wanted them, which I've heard that a lot too, that you just have to wait. And so if, you know, if he could have gone up, got on a month earlier or even two weeks earlier, could have seen more growth there. I don't know how late you could have got water on this. Um, and I don't remember the weather that fall. I don't remember what, it, it was 31. Um, this is in the Orland area. This is a kind of a reclaimed river bottom. This guy had just cleared out a bunch of brush and olives and um, wanted to kind of rehabilitate that and turn it into a better pasture. So he just, and he has a no-till drill. He just drilled that right in, planted it September 1st, again, pretty late. And then the photos were taken that next month and we had some cold weather. And it definitely covered the soil, but again, it wasn't a whole lot there just because it was late. But there's still something there to eat and there's still some growth. You can see here, these little radishes or whatever they are growing there. Do you have any worry about like noxious weeds or weed control? How do you? So weeds is a good question. So, so any of these crops could become weeds if they weren't managed correctly, right? There's also the risk of getting weeds in the seed that you buy. So if you're not buying really high quality seed, just like any other seed you're buying, really make sure that it's got you've got a seed test on it, that you've got a weed test on it, right? And quality. And so that's where you can potentially get some weed issues. And then any of these could become weeds if they weren't managed correctly. Um, the thing about using cold sensitive varieties is that you'll often you'll get a winter kill if it's planted correctly and you're managing it for such they'll get killed off in the winter before they go to seed. If you're planting them earlier in the year, um, they have the potential to go to seed. So rye is a very popular cover crop variety all over the world. Um, but in the Bighorn Basin, because of the barley, people don't really use it because the risk of it going to seed and then contaminating your barley is, is high. So that's not something, that's a high risk for them. Um, and other, but, they have, but they use Roundup in those rotations. And so there's easy, it's easy to deal with some of the other crops that might then overwinter, something like this, right? So it really depends on what you're doing, but it's a good point is, is if you're gonna buy cover crop seed, really make sure it's high quality seed and, and make sure you know that it's been tested for weed, that it's got, that your weed analysis on it, your seed quality analysis, really important. Um, some of these perennials, um, you know, some of the clovers can be things that will just stick around and keep growing and that's maybe not an issue if you're grazing, it may be an issue if you don't want them in your field for some reason. This particular grower in Hot Springs County that had the einkorn field has been looking for something to put in under his corn. And we've been looking at some clovers, um, even some annual clovers to put in underneath the corn. So um, anyway, there's lots of there's lots of ideas out there. But the weed piece is important. This is Park County. This is a trial that at the near the research station. There was um, about a 14 acre field that they were going to take over and try to convert to organic for some certified organic research. It had been alfalfa, the sheep had eaten it down to dirt, there was nothing left. So we put in, worked with Allied Seed and put in three different cover crop mixes. Planted at the end of June, this photo was taken in August. You can see they, they're definitely growing, but you can still see some bare soil in here, right? Uh, that's the same, that photo is just a closer up of that same time frame, one of the different mixes. So there's a lot of biomass that has a lot for the sheep to eat. Um, and it's keeping that soil covered and putting some, some carbon back into that soil. This is in September. This is a mustard. So it's getting a little tall. The sheep didn't like it when it got that tall. So that's another thing to consider when you're looking at grazing crops is optimal grazing time. It's just the same as any, any other um, crop. So hay or pasture, you, knowing when the optimum time for, to cut or to graze for nutrition and palatability, the same thing with cover crops. The challenge may be that if you have several different things in your mix, they may have optimum nutrition at different times, which could be a good thing. Maybe the, then it allows a longer grazing period where you have something that comes on um, in June and then something else that comes on in July. And so that can be an advantage, but 
also something to think about, um, and of course species, what it's gonna like different things. But the sheep, they ended up eating everything eventually. Um, we actually mowed this section because it got too tall, so we knocked it down and then they ate some of that regrowth. Um, and then you'll see here in a minute what it looked like when they were done. This is again in September, you can see, I think this is forage collards here. Um, there's just a lot, a lot going on in there. Is that economical to um, go in and, and basically mow your cover crops? It can be depending on your goal. So if your goal is weed control, say you're going into a, a horticultural uh, uh, production, so either a garden or a market farm, right, to put growing vegetables, and you're growing these for organic weed control, mowing can be a great method, and it can terminate a lot of, some of the annuals will be terminated by mowing, some will regrow again, um, and it can be a great way to keep the ground covered and, and, and compete with weeds. So, so it like depends on, on what your goals are. Right, like the, on the grass seed you were saying, and what height did you cut them to, to take the seed heads off to try to keep I don't, rem I don't remember, because I wasn't there when they cut, but it was just a, a deck mower that they, they brought through on a tractor. So, um, ideally, for maximum usage of this forage, we would have had the sheep in there sooner on some of this stuff. And we also didn't have enough sheep in this field to handle the quantity of cover crops because it was 14 acres. So it was two problems. We didn't get them in there fast enough and we didn't have enough to eat it. And so it got ahead of them. So that's the other thing is if we had cross-fenced it, had more sheep and moved them through in like a flash grazing situation, we would have gotten very, I think, very high utilization of these cover crops in a more efficient manner. So that's another thing to consider, is how much forage are you going to get, and how many animals do you have, and how much time, and all that. So um, another consideration there. When you're grazing the, the cover crops, I mean, are you mostly following that take 50, leave 50? I mean, because if you want to benefit the, the stock and the soil, you don't want them to blitz it pretty well. Right. Well, I'll show you this picture when we're done, and it was way over. It was way too much. They took everything eventually because they were there all winter. Uh -huh. So I, again, it depends on what you want to do. So if you wanted to um, grow these cover crops, get some forage, turn the sheep in there, eat everything, including the weeds, and then come in and drill in some oats or something, then maybe you want less there. If you want something that's going to keep the weeds covered, or maybe you have a perennial base of grass, and you want to sod, to, and I'll get into this a little bit of sod seeding, but you want to plant in some annual crops, but leave, but your grass continues growing underneath them, then you want to manage it a little bit different there. Um, I, I know I keep saying this a lot, but it really depends on what your goals are. Um, so, you know, you can come through and, and um, if you, like you, like when you're just grazing grass, you come through with a large quantity of animals very quickly. They eat a fair amount, they also trample a fair amount, and they urinate and defecate and remove all those nutrients, and then they keep cycling it through and moving through. And if you did it that way, you would get more nutrients then cycled back into the soil and for the soil benefit, right? If you took more off, then you would get potentially more biomass, more quantity of forage, but leave less behind for the soil. Okay. There's, a, you want. there's a couple yeah. guys in, the, in Fremont County that are playing with uh, winter crops like uh, winter wheat and triticale. And mm -hmm. They're planting in uh, early September. Yeah. And apparently, they're even able to uh, graze it a little bit yeah. in early spring and still get uh, it's really a crop cool. out. Yeah, you can do it with wheat. Um, dual purpose, when you'll, you can look, if you want to look up, do some more of your research, dual purpose wheat is what you can, you'll find it under often. This um, this field here at Einkorn in Hopkins County, that same producer did a little bit of that dual purpose wheat where if you plant your winter wheat early fall or late summer, even August or July sometime, you can let it grow, graze it, just don't get below the growing points let it go through the winter, that following spring, you can decide to graze it again or to let it go to grain depending on markets and forage availability. So it gives you a lot of flexibility um, and it can certainly handle. Spelt can do the same thing. I guess triticale probably could too. Um, but the idea is that it gives you, it gives you, first of all, if you get something in the ground and something growing over the winter, also come spring or summer, you can decide grain markets, forage, what do I need? And it gives you two options. So it's pretty cool. Um, you could probably put other things in with it, I suspect. Um, you know, this is that same part. This is an alfalfa growing back up in here, the lotus. And then, of course, lots of other things else to eat in there. So they didn't kill the alfalfa? They didn't, uh, we didn't spray it or anything, no. Oh, oh. It was, there was really not much left. It had been eaten down to almost nothing. And so it's a little surprising to see a cucumber up in there, but there wasn't a lot that came back. 
because we were transitioning that field to certified organic to do some organic because uh, research station doesn't have any organic research field so there was some interest in that that's why we tried these for weed control and just try things in nutrients that's what the radishes look like that's called a in the cover crops that's called a tillage radish with the food it's called a daikon radish which is very common um, and as you can see, they'll often grow, because of their long tuber, they'll grow down and can break through some compaction. This one, uh, the ground was, this one I pulled out right next to the, to the heated pipe, and you can see that was where the soil was, and so this was sticking up out of the soil, but this was growing down in, so you'll see that too, that they will grow up if they end down. So the animal can pull them up. Absolutely, easy, yeah. yeah, and they really like them. And the same with the turnips, you'll see them just pull them, people will say they pull them right out of the field. Even um, when it's frozen? Yeah, and so what happens eventually, I, I don't know if I have a picture in here, but they'll, so the other thing about the radishes and the turnips is that they're, they store nutrients and they'll store nitrogen, so they'll, put, they'll pull them up out during the growing season and they'll pull things from down deeper in the soil and pull them up into the tuber. If they don't get eaten, the tuber doesn't get eaten, it'll die and then decompose during the winter and leaving those nutrients closer to the top of the soil. So a lot of the cover crops will do that. So they'll pull, they'll scatter nutrients from deeper in the soil and then as they die back, and, and those roots recycle in the, t in the t surface soil, those nutrients have then become much more available to the next crop. So that's one of the other advantages of cover crops. Do you have any trouble with them turnips with their cows choking on them? I, I've never, I've heard anecdotally of that, but no one I've talked to here has ever had that experience. I suppose in theory it could happen maybe with sheep also, but I, I've not talked to anybody locally that's had that happen. Yeah. But I've heard- We haven't seen our turnips get that large. Yeah, I mean, I've heard concern about it, but size at the biggest. and they bite them in half anyway, or bite chunks out of them as they're getting out of the ground, don't they? Often, I have been told yeah, don't stand behind them. Get them out. Yeah, and a lot of cows just can't get the turnips out. Yeah, I've also been told don't stand behind them when they're on a field of turnips. That they <laughs> <very good. laughs> this is what that field looked like; those cover crops in April after having that group of I don't know, fifty sheep or whatever was on them all winter. So there's a little bit of residue here. But not a lot, and so if you were doing this for the soil benefit, again, it depends on what you want to do. But one option would be to pull those sheep off sooner, um, or to um, grow something that produces more residue. So those brassicas don't produce a lot of residue when it's all done; it's a lot of water in those leaves. The the small grains produce a lot more residue and a more fibrous, high carbon root system. Um, so they will provide more of a soil benefit in the long term. So again. It's a huge range of things you can choose, but that's one of the things to think about is are you going for primarily soil benefit, primarily forage, or trying to split the difference and get a little bit of each. This is a dry land trial in Sheridan County. This is, uh, actually it was a trial, this was actually out on the ranch out there. Dry land peas and triticale leaves. This photo was taken June 27th. I on a field tour, I don't know when these were planted, but I thought this was a really great example um, of, a, of a nice forage combination. Peas do not thrive in heat, right? They're a cool season. So if you had straight peas and it was here in the basin or it's been like in the Williams area and it's really, really hot, this is a nice way potentially to do it where the peas come up with the triticale and you get some shade and cooling effect from the triticale. Potentially, you're going to plant it early enough so you're going to get a lot of nitrogen fixation from these peas that you wouldn't get if they don't go in the ground until September or August or something like that. I was showing those pictures earlier. So are those the only two varieties in that? That's the only two things in this field that they What's planted. What's your seeding rate there? I, this I don't know, and I'm sorry, this was not a trial. This was just a farm that we visited or ranch oh, okay. on a farm tour, so I don't know. I don't remember his seeding rate. Um, and I can look up the contact information of that gentleman. He was happy to talk about what he's doing. It's a really interesting thing if you want to follow up with him. Um, so this was, you can see the triticale here and the peas here. And it was just a really nice combination. Um, again, this was dry land. You have to experiment a little bit and see what worked. But an example, of, and the, the peas could go in with any, they could go in with wheat. They could probably go in with a dual purpose wheat, I would imagine, like we just talked about. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try it. Um, Caitlin, since you're mentioning dry land uh, um, and we're looking at going into a drought, are you going to mention some of the more drought tolerant uh, Yeah, so 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these pictures and then I'm going to share some of the resources that are in here which have charts that answer exactly those questions because I think those are really good points. So do you need something that's drought tolerant um, or something that tolerates high, you know, if you have a patch in your field that stays wet and it's, has a lot of salinity issues or some other challenges so you can, you can spot treat a little bit with some of these <coughs> crops, right? So that's a really good question. When was that planted? I don't remember. I'm really sorry. I don't remember. Um, I need to probably call this guy back and find out all the details. This picture was taken in 27. Well, the triticale leaves headed out yeah. along, so it would probably be April, maybe? I'm, I'm guessing, because you want to protect that spring moisture in that field, I'm sure, since it's dry land. Um, the other thing is, I've seen a lot of folks, in the, at least in this area, use that Willow Creek forage weed. I don't know if anybody has experience with that. And I wonder about doing that. It's this Willow Creek forage wheat that doesn't have awns on it, so it's better for grazing. But it's very high producing with these peas. I think could be a nice combination if you got in early enough for the peas to get some growth in the cool before it heated up. I don't know. It'd be fun to experiment with, I think. It could be a nice combination. Yeah, there's a lander producer that's successful with Willow Creek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's been some folks in Ten Sleep have used it in the Sheridan area and Buffalo area. I've talked to several folks that are really happy with the millet, growing millet as a forage crop. But again, it can also get lumped in with the cover crop. Sometimes it goes in mixes. It can be used for a variety of things, but as a as another enemy of forage crop. A warm season, experimental size and heat. This is the field in Hot Springs County. This is actually a project of Barton Sands. Um, this was a producer out there. This was planted the first week of June. Unused field, weeds, cheatgrass. It was a, there was nothing going on there. It was in really poor condition. They put some seeds into it and some water, and this photo was taken in July. And they had some, it looks like some green here, and they've got a lot of brassicas and oats. And I don't know if that's more traditionally there or when they had it. Um, these turnips, we pulled those turnips out. That was July 23rd. It was incredible what that, how that field oh, recovered. Yeah, that was yeah, so. You can also take those home and cook with them, I'm sure. Um, so this was just a really good example of with sometimes with minimal cost, a little bit of seed and water, you can get something to grow. And because this field was really patchy and had been really unproductive and they really hadn't done anything with it, um, a mix like this is great because in some sections that gra the grains, the oats or that whatever that is in there might really thrive. In some sections, your brassicas might thrive, and in some sections, your peas. And so you, by having a mix across a field that's got some problem areas, then you hopefully have something that will always grow, right? Again, back to the diversity. This is how tall it was. You can see this up to their waist here. That, again, was taken, I think, about a week or two later from that first photo. And I just included this because I thought it was neat. This is a, I think this is actually a knapweed plant in the middle of the cover crop. And a little bird's nest in the middle there. Oh. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. Again, there was that more and more life happening in that field. So not only do you have birds there now, you're going to have pollinators, beneficial insects, wildlife, right? So just something more life happening here than it was before. This is some dryland cover crops for grazing. This is a trial in Sheridan. This is buckwheat here that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I just gave you a hint now on that puzzle over there. This is some buckwheat. Uh, Phacelia is this, this one, the seed's got a purple flower on it, really great for pollinators. This is another one of the, the mixes there, it had a lot of oats in it. We were looking at sheep grazing on this one. I realize we're not dry land here, but just to give some examples of what people are doing. This is a ranch in Tensley, tillage radish, that daikon that I was telling you about, and oats. This photo was taken September 27th. Um, you can see it was probably seeded in August sometime. It's pretty small yet. Um, but again, a nice combination. Not really a cover crop particularly. They're already rotating through some alfalfa and, and annual forages there every few years. But a nice way to just add a little bit more into your soil and in for your grazing and a little bit more diversity in there. And the, um, the radishes, the brassicas in general are pretty cold tolerant. They'll usually go down to about 25 degrees before they stop growing. And so you can get, they'll tolerate certainly some frosts and then a little bit more. They like cold better than heat, actually. Again, as you can see where they've come through and grazed it, it'll keep regrowing both the oats and the brassicas as long as the weather cooperates. That was right about before I almost hit one of those. 
Um, keep you on your toes. This is actually in Kansas. This is a field tour of a big feedlot and operation out there that was really interesting. But they are using sorghum and mung beans and harvesting for them for silage together and putting it in silage. So just to get another example of things that to try, you know, mung beans are a thing that we don't eat much here, but I think it's common in um, Asian cuisine. And something else to consider in, in harvesting things together for silage that like that, you know, putting peas in it and whatever it is you're going to grow. But this was an interesting idea of theirs too. They're, they've moved almost completely to the no-till system. So I mentioned sod seeding. I have some articles here for those who are interested. Um, we've been trying to figure this out here in the basin in terms of rehabilitating some of these old sod bound mountain pastures, hay fields, those that are just, they're old. And they're somewhat productive, but wanting to get something else into them and something else growing. And so one term that you'll see used for that is sod seeding. So the idea is you're direct seeding annuals into a perennial base. And you can either kill the perennial base and then transition it to annual crops, or you can keep the perennial base and just drill annuals, some of these varieties into it every year to maximize your grazing. So if you're going to keep your annuals, your, your perennial base, you want to increase your warm season forage in your cool season pasture. So you'll know the grass growth curve in a cool season pasture here in the spring, slow in the summer, back up in the fall again. Is it a cool season grass? So if you need more warm season grazing and you want to really boost the amount of grazing you have, you can drill some of these, plant some of these what would be considered cover crop species, although this isn't quite a cover crop use for them, into these into this grass and get a boost, right? So what's what you really have to do is slow down the perennial the grass, right? So a contact herbicide or that will just slow it down for several weeks but not kill it, or <coughs> overgrazing, basically just graze the snot out of it until there's almost nothing left, but if the grass is still alive, and then plant into it, give your, your annuals a few weeks to grow, and then that grass comes back up underneath it, and you get um, a boost. So that's something to, to think about. Um, direct seed using a no-till drill. The idea is you don't disturb it, right? So you just get some more roots, and it may take some time, two years of doing that, but get more forage and more production. Okay, so how about supplementing it, where he takes a, a cutting off of the cool season mm -hmm. grass, mm -hmm. but it's getting old, he doesn't want to farm it, he has a no-till drill. Right. We just want to supplement it right. with an annual. Right. So, and so we're thinking in this scenario is to use a, like an Everleaf Ode and a, an Austrian winter pea mm -hmm. with the, the brome grass that's in there. Mm -hmm. But he won't let me in there to contact spray the grass. Right, so. right. So let me show you some pictures. And you then can, he'll, he'll fall graze it. So that, that's yeah. the other half yeah. of that story. So, so let me, I'll show you some pictures here in a minute of what happens when you don't do something. We've had several failures where... We didn't slow down the grass enough and then you just waste your seed because the grass just outgrows the brassicas and whatever else so fast. Um, so also overgrazing is an option. The, uh, a contact herbicide like a paraquat or something that just basically burns what's there and then it grows up from underneath. But you have to have enough tissue left to do that, right? So I can um, also be happy to send you the articles on this I've collected and you can share with him if you want, but that getting that grass slowed down is gonna be absolutely key to success, whether it's from grazing or a contact herbicide. I think in this situation, he'll take the chance of, because he has bare areas that'll respond well to Oh, them. there you go. So then you just, at least the yeah. bare areas. And we're sod bound and heavier, yeah, you're not yeah, going you're not you may even see it into that. Yeah. So this is a place outside of Warland. This was a four-year-old alfalfa stand sprayed it with a low rate of glyphosate one week before planting. It was not glyphosate resistant. It was not Roundup Ready alfalfa. Um, orchard grass, because he wanted to fill in long term. Forage collards, turnip. Um, Rapeseed and forage collards up here, and the orchard grass, orchard grass, um, and sorghum sedan, forage collards, and turnip. And I think a BMR corn. The forage collards were the most successful. You can see where they filled in here really beautifully. I was actually kind of skeptical about it, but it worked really, really well. Um, all these filled in beautifully, and he cut it for hay, including the forage collards. So there, there we are filling in with the alfalfa there. There's your orchard grass coming in a little bit too, which will stay. 
hopefully. And that's what it looked like in the hay when I pulled open a bale that had collars in it. I don't know if you get much biomass in there. There's a lot of water in those collars, but it cut down. The cows loved it, and they grew, and it actually grew back, and he got a second cutting out of it. Did they have trouble with it drying down with the he didn't. tobacco leaves? Yeah, he didn't in this particular case. Now, I don't know if you might in other cases have that issue. Um, it may depend on when you cut. This worked really well, but this was just one example. You know, I can't promise it'll work well all the time. But I was actually pretty impressed. And um, it just filled in some of those bare spots that weren't producing anything that were susceptible to weeds in that little bit of alfalfa. Plus, then it left that orchard grass long term in there, right? This is another section of the field. I think this is our, this might be our sorghum and tomato or our BMR corn, I'm not sure. Some radishes here, more forest collars. So it really filled all that in. That would have been a pretty low, you know, sparse areas there in the field. This is a field outside, um, it's kind of by Anderson. So this is an old hay field. They wanted to do exactly what you're saying, put cover crops in for supplemental grazing. We planted this with a no-till drill on August 7th. And you can see where the drill was here. Right? And I don't remember why, I think I don't think he actually sprayed this or something, he might have sprayed this before, there was some reason the grass here was partially dead, and I don't remember why. Um, but you can see where the drill goes through here and where the grass is thriving and nothing grew. This is the same example. So this is what it looked like a few weeks later where these little guys are trying to compete with the grass versus where they actually can get up and get some nutrients and some sunlight. So that's what we've found over and over again. We've seen that um, with trying to get his sod seeding to work. We tried it outside Ten Sleep on a ranch there with um, some wheat and turnips into an old field. Almost nothing came up. Um, partially it was really, really compacted. Uh, and it was hard to get, we didn't get the water on fast enough, I think. The weather just was not quite right to get the water on and then to get some growth. And, um, and then also, we didn't get you know, grass sprayed back. We didn't spray it at all, and I think that would have been a little, or, or graze it, but I think in that case, spraying it with something of contact herbicide would have been the best. And then some of the, what I've been reading on it recommends that if you're, so the other, so I guess let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is what, this was a, keeping the annual sod base, spray, planting in the summer or the spring or fall into it with annuals, right? In your perennial base. This is another, this is another angle on it. So. You want to transition from a perennial, take a hay field and put it into some annuals. So you're going to take your hay field out and put in, start growing some corn and oats for a few years and put it back into hay. So in this case, you're transitioning from a perennial to an annual crop. You're not supplementing. Low cost, low disturbance method, kill the grass in the fall. Kill it dead in the fall with something, right? And then plant something in the spring. Leave that sod undisturbed. Plant something in the spring. Peas, corn, small grains in the spring. And then again, direct seed with no-till drill. So that's another angle on the sod seeding. And I've been looking at some interesting ideas from what folks are doing in other places. Um, and again, some of this is going to depend on the nutrients you have available in that soil. Do you have enough nitrogen left over uh, or available for corn or small grains? And peas can be a good option there too. So, and then that then that will transition you into a few years of an annual. It should be able to do a full rotation and never have to plow it or... In theory, it. yeah. I mean, there, obviously there's some challenges to work out and every field's going to be different. Um, and I don't know, I'd like to see other... Also, so there's some challenges here with, and with Wyoming is we are very dry or, and very cold. Um, low organic matter, low biological activity in our soil. So, although if you're coming out of grass, you're going to have a lot more of that. You're in a better soil. So I'll be I'm really curious to see if, as we start trying more of this, how long it takes that sod to actually break down in such a way that you can more easily plant and use that. So I don't really know. At this point, um, folks are doing it in other areas. We're experimenting here, trying to figure out the best way to reclaim some of these old, retired hay fields and pastures. With well, and this particular person doesn't want to bring a lot of rocks up. Right, that's another good reason, right? We leave the rocks down really hard. Um, so here's one more, I, for those of you who have gardens, this is, um, this is kind of fun, this is the chaos garden. I talked about throwing all your old seeds out. I sent some seeds to a friend of mine. She's got a couple little kids, and they just dug it up, throw the seeds out. These are all garden seeds. 
and this is what their garden was chaos garden. And the kids could go in there and you can see there's flowers, there's kale, there's a tomato plant, there's peas, this is carrots down here, I think. So this is just an example of, it, it, it kind of is a cover crop, you can also eat it. Um, there's um, green cover seed sells a lot of cover seed around the country. And they, they have what they call a milpa mix, which I think is a, I think that term comes from South America. And basically it's corn, beans, squash, and a bunch of other vegetables, and then they sell that to you and you throw that out on an acre, and that's your garden. It's a mix, right? So the idea here is just throw some seed out, it'll grow. You got some leftover seed, throw it out there, it'll grow, right? And that can be great for, it doesn't have to be complicated, I think is the point that I'm getting at. So consider that too. Um, we talked a little about selection. This is a huge topic, could be its own class. Look at your climate and your growing season. When do you want the maximum forage? Do you need spring forage, summer forage, fall forage, or winter stockpile? So figure that out and then you'll know what you need. That'll help. Forage quality, is that important? What kind of forage quality do you need? What is your weed risk? If you're growing barley, you probably don't want to grow a triticalian rye. If you aren't growing barley, maybe it's not a big deal. Um, palatability, and of course seed source, seed cost. And a nitrogen source. Do you need, are you wanting to fix some nitrogen and use some peas or lentils or something to do that? Or um, do you have enough nitrogen there already? This is a very, very good resource. You can just go to SARE.org and look up, search for cover crops. I have a few of these books. Um, you can download this entire book as a PDF for free on their website, or you can buy it for about $20. And once we are finished, I'll turn the light back on and let you guys look at the charts in here. That really, really helps with selection. It's a great resource. Um, actually, I guess that is it. So they also, you can go through um, and download your file here, but then you can also go through all the different types of cover crop species that we, that people have been experimenting with so far. And it'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about each species and what you, how you might use it. So, could you hit the light, please? Thank you. So this, well, I'm going to pass some of these around. You guys can just look at them. Um, just share them around. You can just get an idea of what's in them. And this in the front here. I can not find the front page 66. There are these really handy charts, right? And you can go to the website and just download the document and find these charts, right? So it tells me, for example, that annual ryegrass, nitrogen scavenger, soil builder, erosion fighter, weed fighter, good grazing, and quick growth. And it shows you approximate dry matter pounds per acre you might expect, total nitrogen pounds per acre um, required that you might expect, um, and then Residue, how much residue, harvest value, cash crop. So then over here you get tolerances to heat, drought, shade, flood, and low fertility. For example, rye, highly tolerant to low fertility. Uh, wheat, very low tolerance to flood or wet conditions. So this can be really handy to look through here. It also tells you um, some pH tolerances, hardiness zones. So um, your medics and red clovers, zone four, means they may overwinter here, they likely will. Um, mustards likely won't overwinter here, for example. So these are um, minimum germination temperature. That can, that's also helpful. You get into planting, some basic planting rates, and um, soil impact, soil ecology. Um, is it a subsoiler? Is it, how does it bear traffic, beneficial? So this is a very, oh, and potential disadvantages. Is it high weed risk, et cetera? And then it goes into each individual crop. For example, buckwheat. Here's one. Shows you a map. Shows you a plant. Highlights what we know about it as a cover crop and what you, how you might use it. So, is there anything on water consumption for each one? Of these um, most of them have some information about water. Now, again, this is just based on what the authors knew about these crops when this book was written. And so there's plenty more information out there. But the drought tolerance will be a good indicator. And then in each section on each plant. It may have, if there's been research done on that, it will, it'll be highlighted in here. If you're looking for something really specific, um, you can get a hold of me and I will try and put that information up here. And I will send you, I have a lot of information I've just been collecting, and um, I'm happy to share. 
I have files of information on coming talks that most people don't, and it's more than most people want. But if I can um, share it with you, I will gladly do that. <coughs> send me an email if I can help you and send you resources that I have. And please do come look at some of these plants and some of these seeds. And um, These books are going home with someone today, so name me a few, match a few of these pictures for me and I'll give you a cover crop book. I'm not, I, I don't need any more of these at my office, so these are going home with someone today. And here's a few other articles. This one I really like. This one's cover crops. This is out of Idaho, but they have similar conditions to us. I'll put them up here on the table. Um, cover crops for high desert farming in Idaho and cover crops for grazing. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, has some good information and examples here. And um, West Ag Days is coming up. We've got some programming on, some, on soil health and no-till and various other things. And it will be virtual and live. So we can choose. And that's all I got. Unless you've got questions or discussion or come look at some seeds and well, there you go. So match the plant to the seeds, and a few of them here. This is a lentil, but I don't know what a lentil. That's the lentil, like. yeah. When it's grown up, I don't know. Well, it's a legume. Um, yeah, it's funny. That actually came out of my pantry. Those lentils and the millet, but yeah. <laughs> they are in the flax. Yeah. This is mustard, right? Um, it might be, so the, 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 number, the names are on the bottom, but um, there are some mustard and turnips and radishes, and the seeds all look sort of similar. That's mustard. Okay, yeah. <laughs> nope. Nope. Don't listen See, to it's me. not as easy as you might think. <laughs> Definitely don't listen to me. They're 